happy to be here in this strange format, in this strange time uh, when we canceled the Alt MKE conference in as in physical space, we were sad. And as the date was approaching, we really began to miss it even more. And it was uh, really great that when we send out an inquiry to our plenary speakers for contributions to a website just to mark the conference, that sort of to grieve and remember the conference, um, LA was suggested, oh, I'd like to give my talk. And uh, we were thrilled. So we're really happy that that's the case. And in fact, it inspired us to ask our two local plenary speakers, uh, Dasha Kelly Hamilton and Monique Liston, to participate next week, next Friday, same time, uh, different station, and we'll be um, sending information out about that, where they'll engage in a conversation. Uh, <clears throat> and I think maybe Dasha might read a few poems. Um, okay, so look for information about that or feel free to contact us. Um, usually when we do our uh, C21 talks on the UWM campus, we begin with a land acknowledgement, uh, thanking the people who were here before us for allowing us to use the land that we basically stole from them. Um, but in this environment, I think it's probably more appropriate for us to begin by acknowledging all of the essential workers uh, who have made it possible for us to continue to live some decimally of our personal and professional lives through this, who've put their lives on the line, risked their safety and well being for um, sadly underpaid wages, um, to make it possible for uh, events like this to happen. Uh, and I think also it's really important for us too, maybe just to take a moment of silence for the 75,000 plus people who've died from this. So I think why don't we just take a brief moment and Okay, thank you. Um, So L.A. Kaufman's been involved in grassroots movements as a journalist, historian, organizer, and strategist for more than 35 years. I actually first, uh, I probably had heard of L.A., but I really heard about L.A. from my uh, dear friend and colleague and soon department chair, Lane Hall, who uh, has for years been saying, L.A. Kaufman, she's doing amazing work. We have to get her to the center. We have to do something with L.A. Kaufman. We have to bring her into UWM. And so the Alt-MKE um, venue seemed like the perfect place for that. Um, L.A. was a central strategist for the campaign that saved more than 100 New York City community gardens from being demolished. During one city land auction, they released 10,000 crickets which was uh, her own plan. She was the mobilizing coordinator for the anti-war protests of 2003 and 2004, some of the largest demonstrations in US history. And her writings on organizing and social movement history have been published in The Guardian, The Nation, The Progressive, Mother Jones, Village Voice, N Plus One, The Baffler, and more. And currently she is involved in a range of projects to oppose the Trump presidency as are pretty much <clears throat> all of us, I think. Um, LA is a native of Milwaukee, grew up here and uh, has particular ties. And uh, her talk today will tell us, I think, a lot more about that certainly than I know. So uh, with no further ado, I'm gonna turn the screen over to uh, LA Kaufman. And how about a virtual or non-virtual round of applause? You can unmute for that. Thank you so much, Richard and Maureen, and I'm and thank you everyone who's here attending today. Um, I was so glad um, that the Center for 21st Century Studies uh, was game to continue with this talk, um, even though it's in changed circumstances. And it's also a different talk from the talk that I was planning to give at um, the original conference. Obviously, uh, the, 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 what I used to the title, the I want a haircut action had not happened. The coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, had not started. 
Um, but I also want to flag before I jump into the meat of the talk that um, uh, a lot of the research that I was going to do for this talk, I was planning to do on an earlier uh, planned trip in early April to Wisconsin, um, and I simply wasn't able to complete it. So um, this talk is, um, uh, you know, very much uh, drawing on fragmentary and uh, provisional research into this topic, um, and I hope you all will bear with me. Um, the original project that I was undertaking, um, uh, you know, I grew up uh, in Waukesha County. You, you're going to hear much more about that. Um, and as Waukesha County emerged as uh, what, you know, as many of you know, uh, it could end up being the decisive county or one of the decisive counties in the 2020 presidential race. As that, as I became more and more aware of this, um, I started um, looking back into um, the, the political history of the county, um, and I was intending to do, a, you know, an almost year-long participant observer project with many visits to Wisconsin um, to uh, interview people working on the presidential campaign to get a feel for what was happening on the grassroots in Waukesha County while simultaneously doing um, historic research. Um, and uh, the idea was that um, I was going to write a book that was weaving together this past and present. Um, uh, not clear where that project stands. I'm obviously not traveling back and forth to Wisconsin right now, um, but I'm grateful for this opportunity to at least share some of the research and thinking that I've done um, uh, about um, Waukesha County and the Milwaukee suburbs and the history of the far right. Um, uh, and I want to start by saying I think you really can't um, think about the history of Milwaukee separate from its suburbs, um, that the suburbs um, grew up in very uh, intimate relationship to Milwaukee um, and uh, uh, defined themselves in many ways in opposition to Milwaukee. Um, but also uh, shaped the policies that would influence the city and its um, trajectory. Um, the story that I'm going to tell, I decided to tell it as a glass half full story. Um, uh, you could also tell it as a glass half empty. Um, uh, so I'm framing it as the, the limitations um, to the far right project. But of course, there have been many successes to the far right project in Wisconsin. And, um, uh, uh, but, you know, we, we have all been living with enough bad news in this time. Um, I want to look at the limitations on this far right project. So give me a second here. I'm going to open up my screen and hope that, let's see. Second. All right. So we start with I want a haircut. All right. So this is, oops, hang on. Let me back it up. I want a haircut. So this is, of course, an image from the protest that took place at, oops, at, uh, I'm going to hope we don't have a tech problem of having it. Here we go. Maybe this is going to work better. Sorry. We thought we troubleshooted the, uh, the screen share. Can you all see it right now? Let me see. I'm not seeing the chat. Sorry, bear with me, everyone. I am not seeing the chat. It says I'm screen sharing, but you are all probably only seeing. Darn, hang on. We can see it. All right. There we go. Okay. So I want a haircut. So this is an image from the protest that took place uh, against uh, Governor Evers' uh, lockdown orders um, uh, about two weeks ago uh, at Brookfield Square Mall. Um, this woman, as widely commented, uh, is not saying I want to give a haircut. She's not saying she wants to go back to work. She's saying she wants other people to work for her. Um, there are other signs. This is another image from this protest. Uh, open Wisconsin now, go back to work. Um, and uh, uh, most strikingly, of course, there was someone carrying a Confederate flag uh, at this protest. Um, the protest drew about a thousand people, which is uh, the largest protest I know of ever having taken place uh, in Brookfield. Um, 
it was organized by a, a photographer and father of three from Iguanago, a guy named Dale Porter, um, but who also collaborated with a long-term uh, right-wing organizer named Paris Procopis, uh, who said uh, in a news account, it's not a Tea Party movement, it's concerned citizens who are very frustrated with what's going on. We're just frustrated. We've done our part. We need to get back working. For people who say we're going into harm's way, all I have to say is my body, my choice. Um, picking up, of course, the feminist slogan. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time uh, uh, researching this guy, um, but he's uh, you know, very much a Tea Party uh, type uh, organizer. Um, he describes himself on Twitter as a conservative writer, blogger, and internet radio personality. Um, and uh, I didn't spend a lot of time researching him, um, but I did see he writes for the Wisconsin Conservative Digest. Um, he's uh, emphatically pro-Trump. Um, and among his opinions are the idea, uh, while we see the Confederate flag uh, being displayed at this protest, that the rainbow flag, this is a quote from him, the rainbow flag is a symbol of hate and should be banned. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, so uh, the first thing that jumped out to me when I, about this protest was that it took place at Brookfield Square, which is a place where I wasted many an afternoon uh, in my childhood in middle school years. This is what it looked like in the 70s. Um, here's another image. Uh, there's the Walden books that was in the mall, which were a place I got a lot of my books growing up. Oops, hang on. I'm getting used to the idea of how to do this screen share. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of themes in this protest that, uh, that strike me as hallmarks of the far right in the Milwaukee suburbs. Um, there's a free market fundamentalism that elevates the rights of businesses, and especially business owners, over those of employees and consumers, right? It's go back to work. It's not we want to work. It's we want you to go back to work for us. Uh, a hostility to government regulation. Um, you see a, a prominent place for women as um, organizers and spokespeople, um, which is true uh, throughout a lot of far right organizing. Um, uh, overt racism, um, and then disingenuousness, uh, an attempt to disguise or mask the actual sponsorship, the actual political agenda, the actual political identity. Um, as you'll see, these, um, these uh, qualities of this protest at Brookfield Square um, have a long and deep history. Um, now, uh, in case there's anyone who's not familiar with Waukesha County, who's um, uh, watching this webinar, here's a map. It's not a map of the whole county, um, but if you can see over on the right-hand side, I wonder if I can show the, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this is Elm Grove. This is where I grew up. Um, Brookfield is, Elm Grove uh, was carved out in the mid fifties as a smaller little village within um, the larger community of Brookfield. Brookfield Square Mall is right about there uh, where the freeway um, meets uh, Blue Mound Road. Um, and uh, Elm Grove is right on the border um, uh, with Milwaukee County. That's Wauwatosa that's just um, to the right of the border there. Um, but it's a right on the county line. Um, uh, Waukesha County has been a, a long-standing Republican stronghold. Um, it voted strongly for Reagan in 1980, um, which is when I was in high school. Um, and which was a, an event that marked my kind of first political awakening. Um, uh, Scott Walker carried uh, roughly 72% of the vote in Waukesha County in 2010, 2012, and 2014. Um, Donald Trump carried Waukesha County by 60% in 2016. Um, but Waukesha County has been shifting in recent times and those percentages keep going down. Um, in 2018, just 66% of Waukesha County voters supported Scott Walker, um, and his margin there dropped significantly uh, by about 18,000 votes compared to four years uh, before. Um, and then most recently in the special election that happened on April 7th of this year, um, uh, in which Judge uh, Jill uh, Karofsky, um, uh, the Democrat candidate, uh, unexpectedly uh, won um, her race for the state for the state Supreme Court, um, the GOP share of the vote in Waukesha County shrunk still further. Um, and this, um, these shifts are why Waukesha County is uh, considered so um, strategically important for 2020. 
Um, it, it is not uh, the expectation that uh, that the Democratic candidate uh, would win a majority, but uh, by siphoning down the percentage of uh, Republican votes, um, uh, if uh, if that were to be the case this November, that could um, deprive Donald Trump of a win in Wisconsin and um, potentially uh, cause him to lose uh, in the Electoral College. So, um, so you know, when I so here here's a, a picture from my childhood. That's uh, that's uh, whoops. I'm going. I'm really learning how to do this screen share here. So, you know, I, I here I am uh, in uh, the, the first house we lived in in Elm Grove, which was right on the border um, there with Wauwatosa. Um, that's me on the right. Um, I, my sister's looking a lot cooler than I am. Um, I'm maybe five or six years old in this picture. Um, and I, you know, growing up, I really thought, and looking back even into adulthood, I thought of my childhood as a pretty classic, uneventful, white suburban childhood, um, albeit one that, that launched me on a different path for many of my peers. Um, until the 1980 election, I, I didn't really think about the politics of the place at all. And I really thought of it as outside politics. Um, you know, I had a childhood with, you know, here's some 70s fashion from, from uh, Christmas uh, in, I don't know what year this would be, 1972. Here I am, that's me with the hat in the middle. Oops, let's go back. That's me with the hat uh, in the middle right here. This is the 1976 Bicentennial marching in one of uh, many patriotic parades that took place in Elm Grove. Um, and, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time at the local pool and, oops, I am losing this. I am having uh, more, here we go. Here I am after having been at the pool reading in front of the Elm Grove Public Library, um, which is where I had uh, my first job, my first paid job. I want to say my second paid job was at UWM, was at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee Library. Um, uh, uh, you know, so it's very, very kind of idyllic, classic suburban childhood. Um, I do want to note one one favorite book that I got there at the library um, was the book Harriet the Spy. And I keep uh, losing the full screen here. Um, the book Harriet the Spy uh, by Louise Fitzhugh, um, which was a very popular book uh, uh, in the 70s. Um, you know, I think Harriet, who's there pictured there, was this, was the sort of uh, the, the the butch hero I didn't know I needed uh, in my childhood. Um, but it's a story. She's she grows up in New York City. Um, she has a spy route where she goes around um, spying on her neighbors to learn about life in the world. And like many a uh, a seventies girl, I followed this example and I had a spy route. Um, you know, in roughly 1975, 1976, uh, where I went around um, trying to learn things about my next door neighbors and the neighbors who lived behind me. Um, my next door neighbors were the Grady family and the, the family behind me were the Jacobs, who um, Janet Jacobs was Bill Grady, uh, Bill and Margaret Grady's um, daughter. Um, and I still have the notes from my spy route. Uh, but I never found anything very interesting. It would be like, they're in the kitchen uh, eating their meal, or, you know, they just drove in the driveway. Um, uh, here I am uh, a little later. That's the, the Grady's house in the background. That's me. Oops. Um, but, you know, for the most part, it was a pretty classic, uh, uh, you know, white suburban childhood. Uh, I am not actually in this picture, but uh, there's, I'm happy to say, no photographic record of the fact that I was a cheerleader in middle school, uh, but I was um, uh, at Pilgrim Park Junior High School, just down the road from Brookfield Square Mall. Um, and, uh, you know, as uh, I moved into high school, uh, my interest began to change. Um, I was in the drama club. Here I am doing lighting. Um, uh, and I began after Reagan was elected uh, in 1980 um, to have a political awakening. Um, uh, and as I said, I, I took my first job at the Elm Grove Public Library and uh, was surprised by a comment that um, my neighbors, the Grady's, made to my parents that they were very unhappy that I had taken this job um, because they said uh, public libraries are socialist institutions, um, a comment that made me more rather than less curious about socialism, um, and uh, people should buy their own books. 
So this kind of puzzled me, and I, I sort of knew that that the the Grady's were part of this organization called the John Birch Society, but I didn't know too much about it, and I didn't think too much about it. Um, I was in the midst of my own political awakening, particularly around feminist issues, and I, um, this is the March 1982 issue, but I, in the summer of 1981, I joined the Milwaukee chapter of the National Organization for Women. I used to drive down from Elm Grove. Um, there was a move afoot um, to deny uh, reproductive rights to minors in the state of Wisconsin, and that galvanized me. Um, and it was also the final stages of the fight for the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, so in uh, September 1981, I went to my first rally, which was a rally before a debate between Phyllis Schlafly, who has now uh, become wider known thanks to the, the show Mrs. America, uh, Phyllis Schlafly, the far-right activist and anti-leader uh, of the Stop ERA movement, um, had a debate with Sarah Weddington, who was the lead attorney in uh, the Roe versus Wade um, case at the Supreme Court. Um, so I uh, helped uh, phone bank to get people to go to this event. It was, uh, um, you know, uh, and uh, attended this debate. Um, uh, I. Uh, continued being involved in this Milwaukee chapter now as a regular member. Um, and uh, although it was becoming increasingly clear that the um, Equal Rights Amendment was going to fail, um, I went uh, with uh, my pal, uh, Joe St. Clair. Uh, we went to the rally in Springfield um, uh, in June 1982. Um, this was my first big political march. And I never looked back. Um, I continued to be a political organizer um, ever since. Um, so, um, but so, but in fact, you know, history was unfolding all around me uh, in Elm Grove and Brookfield uh, and Waukesha County in ways that I just wasn't aware of as I was growing up. Um, when I first started this research um, and was thinking about this talk, I was thinking first and foremost about the kind of casual racism that surrounded me in my childhood um, and how white identity in the Milwaukee suburbs uh, was bound up with the history of the black civil rights struggle there, um, something that I was totally unaware of growing up. Um, when, uh, uh, you know, it, it, I, I was startled to, to realize that the, that the cheer that we chanted for the Pilgrim Park Panthers in the 1970s was a Black Panther chant. We chanted, ooh, Angawa, Panthers got the power. This was an all-white cheerleading squad cheering to an all-white team in a nearly all-white school using a Black Panther cheer, um, which is just bizarre. Um, um, uh, my friend uh, who went to the uh, ERA march uh, with me, um, uh, reminded me something that had not sunk in at the time, I'm embarrassed to say, which is that in the spring of 1981, we had a high school production at Brookfield Central High School that featured two characters in blackface. So there was a level of um, casual racism uh, that was part of the upbringing. Um, and then I, um, in thinking about, I was led to this book, which I want to strongly recommend to anyone who's interested in the history of Milwaukee. It's a fantastic account, The Selma of the North, about the civil rights insurgency um, in Milwaukee. Um, uh, and uh, a lot of history that unfolded around me again in my childhood, but that I wasn't aware of. Um, here's an image of me. Um, this is right after my family moved um, to Elm Grove. So this is in September 1967. My sisters are getting on the school bus um, and I'm standing there in my little sweater um, looking out at them. Um, and I'm also looking out at that borderline. That's 124th Street and that's the boundary between Wauwatosa, um, Milwaukee County, which is right behind me um, and where we lived right there um, on the corner uh, of Elm Grove. Um, now just a year earlier, um, Father Grappi, uh, the Catholic civil rights leader um, who played such a crucial role in the civil rights fight in Milwaukee, and the NAACP Youth Council um, had gone to Wauwatosa um, in order to picket uh, at the Eagles Club there. Um, and they were met with an angry crowd that included robed Klansmen in Wauwatosa and signs that read, Keep Tosa White. 
And just one month before this photo was taken, right after my family, we had just moved um, to the area, um, riots had broken out in a small section of Milwaukee. Um, the summer of 67 is a, a summer when there were more than 150 um, uh, racially uh, inflected riots around the United States. Um, it, it began with, a, with just a dispute between two black residents, um, but then it escalated when white police showed up. Um, and uh, here's an image of uh, one of the, the uh, roadblocks in the, the riot area. Um, Milwaukee's mayor at the time, Henry Meyer, um, took the hardest line of any mayor in the whole U.S. towards the riots, and he ordered a total shutdown and crackdown. Um, he declared martial law, um, and you can see vehicles being stopped. Um, and this happened, as it turns out, in the suburbs as well. Um, and in fact, the streets of Wauwatosa were blocked um, during these riots. Um, and 124th Street, right next to, right just down from my house, uh, was blocked. Um, my uh, oldest sister can remember being in the second floor of our house and seeing smoke from the riots. I have obviously no memory of this. I was so small. Um, and remembers that my father, um, who uh, had come to Milwaukee in order to start the transplant program at uh, Milwaukee County Hospital. Um, this is him, a news photo of him in 1968 after he um, uh, conducted a heart transplant. Um, he was one of the few people who was allowed through the roadblock um, because he was going to and from the hospital. Um, but uh, the, the, the truth is um, they had these, these barricades, but as this headline says, the police were ready, but trouble never came. Um, you could see they, you know, they had taped the glass on the windows. There was all of this fear that armed black radicals were going to come and invade the suburbs and I don't know do what. Um, uh, but, but that was the fear and it was a, a fear that never materialized. Um, so uh, the, the Elm Leaves, um, which is the local newspaper in Elm Grove, that picture of me where I'm sitting outside the library um, ran in the Elm Leaves. Um, they editorialized Waukesha County suburbs along the Milwaukee border gave excellent and very valuable cooperation to the central city of Milwaukee during the curfew period that followed the outbreak of race riots there. Without such help from suburbia, Milwaukee's problems and difficulties would have been much greater. If you must know the truth, what took place there has made us a little sick and a little ashamed that such tragic things could happen in our country as we witnessed last week. Um, the, the sickness and the shame was not about the, um, the violent police response. It was about the anger of um, the black residents. Um, and in the next issue of the Unleaves um, uh, went further um, uh, and speculated about the disturbances, the civil dis disturbances that had happened and said, is there a great communistic plot for the destruction of law and order in the United States, which is intended to propagate a full scale conflict between the Caucasian and the Negro races? And this editorial went on uh, to speculate about the various ways in which um, communists had deliberately planned riots around the country. Now, there's something interesting about this. This is where um, this took place, this uh, appeared. The Elm Leaves, as it happened, um, uh, was owned uh, by the man who would later become my next door neighbor when we moved to the other side of Elm Grove, um, Bill Grady. Oops, and I'm losing the, I'm gonna lose this so many times. Hang on, back to full screen, all right. Um, and, you know, in fact, there was a, a different kind of plot that was underway in the Milwaukee suburbs. Um, and the neighbors, that I, but in fact, they had actually played a central role in a number of other, in, in a whole number of, um, uh, concealed and uh, surreptitious uh, attempts um, at political control. Um, so the Elm Leaves was owned by the man who would later be my next door neighbor. Um, it was one of a series of vehicles that he uh, and his daughter, um, uh, Janet Jacobs, um, who I will note um, was always lovely to me personally and a, a very good friend to my mother, um, but as they used to promote um, far right politics of the John Birch Society in Elm Grove, Waukesha County and the U.S. as a whole. Um, 
here's the cover of the biography of uh, Bill Grady that was commissioned by his family. Um, he, uh, you know, became in the, back in, in the 1920s, he bought up a foundry, um, and, which later evolved into Grady foundries. Um, and he was, so he was a key iron and steel manufacturer. Um, and for quite some time was the president of the National Association of Manufacturers. Um, he was a virulently anti-union. Um, uh, uh, he was very religious. This is him giving a speech at the uh, YMCA that's showing where he traveled around the world. Um, and he, um, along with uh, Robert Welch and Fred Koch, the father of Charles and David Koch, the infamous Koch brothers, was one of 12 founders of the John Birch Society in 1958. Um, the John Birch Society, um, for those who aren't familiar with it, is a far right wing society um, that supported law and order, um, believed that there was a vast communist conspiracy um, uh, that was at work uh, directed by by the Soviet Union to undermine um, American ideals. They were um, uh, uh, staunch libertarians, anti-government, anti-regulation. Um, they were racist, uh, anti-immigrant, and anti-abortion. Um, here's a, a John Birch Society billboard, um, whoops, that uh, uh, may strike a, a familiar chord with some of the rhetoric we've heard in recent years. Um, uh, you know, the John Birch Society, you know, it's striking because um, progressive organizations that, that emerged in the same period, you can find, you know, can fill your bookshelf with books about them. Um, and the John Birch Society has really been understudied um, ha as, um, uh, you know, the right wing as a whole has been compared to progressive movements. And it, it's striking how many of its themes and priorities have migrated into the mainstream of the Republican Party, um, the Wisconsin Republican Party of Scott Walker, to be sure, and the National Republican Party of Donald Trump. Um, Claire Connor, who grew up, uh, a woman who grew up in a John Birch Society family and wrote the important memoir, Wrapped in the Flag, A Personal History of America's Radical Right, um, uh, which came out in 2013, um, wrote about the Tea Party, this new radical right is a rewrite of the old John Birch Society. This time, however, the movement has enormous political muscle, unlimited dollars, and right-wing media support, um, including, uh, you know, the support of the, um, the Koch brothers, the sons of Fred Koch, one of the, the John Birch Society founders. Um, so uh, there's a quote uh, that Bill Grady had about, uh, from 1964, um, the year that I was born, that captured this worldview. Um, and it's a quote um, that reads uh, in a way that's very chilling to me in this moment as we live through um, this current crisis. He said, if we want freedom, we must act like free men, discard our government crutch and stand tall, independent and free. Reject the next proposal for new government aids to build your schools, hospitals, play areas, etc. Reject the government's help in the field of credit, researched, distressed areas, and whatnot. Do it yourself, and don't tell me you can't after the miracle of free America. But here is the thing about the John Birch Society, and again, this is a point where um, my, my research um, is incomplete. Um, uh, but when I look back um, at the history of the John Birch Society efforts, which it turned out were extensive um, in Waukesha County, um, and which I only know, uh, you know, about some of, the more openly it pursued its aims, the more likely it was to fail over and over again. So take the Elm Grove Public Library, the one where I worked and the one where the Grady's didn't think I should work because people should buy their own books. Um, it turns out um, that they had been part of an effort to control the Elm Grove Public Library. This is a story from 1961, um, where uh, Elm Grove was going to begin having a public library, and the trustees uh, were really uncomfortable with the idea of having a library with a wide range of ideas in it. Um, uh, 
it's uh, incredibly frustrating to me that I was not able to um, learn more about this dispute. This is one of the one of the top items on my research agenda for when I can next make it back to the State Historical Society and to UWM. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the Grady's, of course, owned the elm leaves at this time, and I don't know how they covered this controversy. Um, here is a, a photograph of uh, the library and sitting in the empty library because the, the opening was delayed for so long uh, because of this controversy over what books they could or couldn't have. Um, uh, uh, I don't know how it played out, but I do know that the library opened and that the library opened with a full range of books um, and that the, the Birch faction lost. Um, this is a, an image from opening day. They had more than 500 people um, come uh, and uh, celebrate the opening of a, a public library with a wide range of books in uh, early 1962. Uh, so uh, the, the John Birch Society folks um, having failed to control the contents of the library, um, moved to open their own bookstore, um, and uh, this is in 1965. Um, this was at a time when the John Birch Society nationwide um, uh, was uh, quite robust. It had 80,000 members, 220 paid staff, and 350 bookstores. Um, uh, again, this is a really understudied phenomenon. Um, you know, a lot of people have written about the left-wing underground and alternative press of the 1960s and about the gay and feminist and African-American and other independent bookstores that emerged in that period, but very little has been written about this infrastructure, um, which uh, my understanding is that these bookstores flourished for a fairly brief period of time um, before they contracted. Um, so uh, they set up their network of bookstores. Next, they tried to take over the Waukesha, uh, key elements of the Waukesha County Republican Party, um, in particular the Federation of Republican Women. Um, uh, here's a new story um, from 1967, um, where uh, moderate uh, Republican women um, try uh, and ultimately succeeded in uh, keeping the John Birch Society folks, including my neighbor, um, from controlling the, uh, the county Republican Party. Um, there's a report in the Waukesha Daily Freeman that talks about how um, the subterfuge that the Birch faction used um, to try to suggest that they had more support than they really did um, by scattering their members throughout the room during the meeting. Um, uh, at, at the Birch Society um, shrunk considerably um, in the late 60s, but it, it continues to this day. Um, and the smaller they got, the more they were using subterfuge and, um, and fronts, uh, front groups, uh, such as the front group that they used to try uh, to support Phyllis Schlafly and the anti-ERA movement. Um, Robert Welch uh, described this as a key tactic of the Birch Society, to use little fronts, big fronts, temporary fronts, permanent fronts, all kinds of fronts. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, that um, stealth strategy uh, of pushing a, a stealth agenda um, and using um, various organizational containers to mask your real aims um, is a real hallmark of um, the right-wing um, strategy uh, uh, in the Walker era uh, with Alec and the Koch brothers um, using uh, their money in, in various disguised ways in order to push the far-right agenda. Um, it's one of the, the most enduring legacies of the John Birch Society. That's where you get the half uh, the glass half empty is that, um, you know, in fact, these, these tactics worked many times. Um, but, you know, uh, again and again, you know, with, uh, in so many ways, there's this political saying that, that has a different resonance in the era of coronavirus, which is that sunlight is a great disinfectant. Um, and what I see when I look at this history and these series of efforts um, by the far right uh, in, in the suburbs is that when the ideas are fully exposed, um, they rarely gain much traction. Um, and that, that's true now. This is an image from the follow-up one of the lockdown protests in, in Brookfield Square Mall 
Um, it was, they've got those same pre-printed signs. I tried looking into uh, who printed them. Um, in, in my uh, most recent book, How to Read a Protest, I talk a lot about how you can look closely and decipher protest signs to understand who's really behind an event. Um, this one, those, those, that sign that that guy's holding has all the hallmarks of an of a organized right-wing um, effort to me. Um, uh, when they had the follow-up protest um, uh, just a few days ago on May 2nd, very few people showed up, um, and polls show that, in fact, uh, uh, people in Wisconsin, not just in Waukesha County, but throughout the state, overwhelmingly support um, the common sense measures to control the spread of coronavirus, um, uh, and certainly uh, having the, the racism at the core of this movement publicly displayed with that Confederate flag backfired um, considerably, um, invited uh, a lot of, uh, of well-deserved criticism. Um, again, it's that sunlight is disinfected. The, when when the, the, the actual extreme ideas um, are exposed to public view, they have very little support. Um, so I'm, um, Milwaukee suburbs have another history too, and they always have. Um, and I wasn't any more aware of the other one when I was growing up, um, but it shaped me just the same. Um, I'm going to end with this image. This is an image from the Welfare Mothers March um, that was organized by Father Groppi in August 1969. Um, and these are marchers marching through Brookfield um, along Capitol Drive. Um, Brookfield uh, hastily passed an anti-picketing law when they heard that they were coming. Um, so that uh, the marchers wouldn't pick at the home of a local Republican assemblyman. Um, they did anyway, uh, and four of them, including a UWM professor, were briefly arrested. Um, but uh, that's not the part of the story I want to highlight. Um, as um, these marchers, um, as part of this, the, the long fight over um, housing and justice and economic and social justice in Milwaukee, as they marched through Waukesha County, as they marched through Brookfield, they were welcomed and supported by local residents from Unitarian Church West and given a place to stay for the night um, on their way to Madison. Um, Waukesha County's always had people in both political parties, in both political parties, um, who believed in very different values from the extremist positions of the far right. Um, Recently, we're seeing these major shifts in voter allegiances in the county, um, and seeing that the that that the 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 more that the Republican Party is associated with the extremism of Donald Trump, uh, the more that that majority gets slimmer and slimmer. Um, you know, some of the developments in the county that I was going to report on, um, if I had uh, been able to spend uh, more time there this year, um, it are. Um, you know, the many shifts that are happening in organizing in the county. The chair of the local uh, Waukesha County Democratic Party is the youngest party chair in the whole country, Matt Marino. Um, uh, one of the, the, the local progressive groups, um, Drinking Liberally, uh, which uh, meets, uh, well now it meets virtually, but it was meeting once a month uh, in Waukesha. Uh, it's the largest chapter of Drinking Liberally in the country. Um, and there's all kinds of grassroots hustle from local groups like the Brookfield Action Team, um, who I just got an email from today, um, that they uh, you had been doing door-to-door -door canvassing in Elm Grove and Brookfield, and now they're, they, like everybody else, are doing events on Zoom. Um, so, you know, the, the I Want a Haircut protests, they got huge media attention because they were flashy and provocative, um, but they didn't actually work. They didn't actually succeed in rallying support. Um, these, again, um, are just some notes and observations towards a history of the far right in the suburbs, but where they leave me is with a feeling of hope um, that um, these um, sites like Waukesha County that have been, um, uh, you know, the recurring focus of far right organizing are not destined um, to have that identity politically. And um, if anything, the, um, the trend that we're seeing now is in quite the opposite direction. So um, with that, I'll, I'll stop and I'll move to any questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, so LA, if you look at down below the Q and A, you could just click that and read the question. We have one so far. Can you see that? Oh yeah, let's see. It's got a number one. If you click that, you can read it and respond. Yes. Um, so I don't know if everybody can see the question. Um, it says, I live near UWM. I know Elm Grove. I'm taking my daughters to theater classes at Sunset Playhouse. I think of Elm Grove as being one of the wealthiest boroughs in the state, not just the whitest. Um, could you talk about your experience of class and wealth growing up? Uh, was Elm Grove's incorporation in 1955 as much about the wealthy protecting their assets as consolidating their whiteness? Um, it was incorporated earlier than the race riots of the 60s. Um, I, uh, you know, there was a big fight around um, the incorporation of Elm Grove, which um, I don't <clears throat> yet understand. I've only been able to read a little bit about it, um, so I don't have a good answer on that, on why exactly um, Elm Grove wanted to essentially secede from Brookfield. Um, but yes, absolutely. Um, Elm Grove uh, is, uh, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know in comparative terms, but it must be one of the most affluent um, communities in Wisconsin. And um, uh, the, the Grady's um, uh, and the John Birch Society, their agenda um, included, uh, they were vehemently opposed to progressive taxation. Um, they were vehemently opposed to any form of redistribution of wealth, uh, particularly their wealth, as uh, you know, he, uh, as I said, he ran a series of foundries um, and was a very successful businessman. Um, so uh, I think that um, absolutely the, um, the larger Republican political agenda in Elm Grove um, had to do um, with uh, class and um, class privilege, and that there were elements for sure in the far right agenda there that were um, about taking extreme measures to protect the extreme profits of a handful of the wealthiest um, members of the community. Thanks. Um, there's another question that Lane Hall had. Um, on what grounds do we differentiate right-wing subterfuge from left-wing tactical media based on similar tactics? Um, right, I mean, uh, right, there's times uh, where, um, well, for example, uh, Richard had mentioned the, the cricket action that I was part of. So there's definitely times when you're, you know, when I've been organizing protests where you don't necessarily say who you are, where you make up a name of a, a provisional name of a group, um, a front group, if you will, um, for tactical reasons. So uh, with the cricket action, you know, we didn't say, uh, I was part of a group called the Lower East Side Collective. We didn't claim uh, that action, we we created a group called Jiminy Cricket, and we sent out our press releases under the name Jiminy Cricket, and we had a, a fake name for our, our uh, press spokesperson, um, Wendy Madison. Um, uh, so, but I think um, I think the difference here, uh, you know, when you when you look at longer term organizing strategies, like yes, there are moments when people. Um, on the left will use a kind of a trickster facade or um, uh, that kind of masking um, as part of a, of a, a performance or, a, or an intervention. But um, in longer term organizing projects, um, uh, apart from, there are some far left groups that use front groups as a consistent strategy. There's a series of like small, um, socialist almost cult parties that have done that o over time but but i really don't see that as a widespread practice that usually um progressive groups are advocating values that are widely shared and so if anything they want to be more open about what they stand for rather than hiding it um cloaking it 
um, masking what they're doing. Thanks. Now I'm going to go out of order because Maureen Ryan has a question that's related to the left wing, right wing question Lane asked. She says, I'm so curious about the use of leftist slogans, my body, my choice, etc., by protesters today and by your middle school cheerleading team. Do you have a sense of how deliberate or self-aware these moves are? Well, the My Body, My Choice, this has been a really deliberate um, right-wing strategy right now during the coronavirus pandemic um, to uh, push back against um, common sense public health measures, particularly face coverings. Um, and, uh, you know, I have to give it to them, it was very clever. It's a, it's a very clever co-optation of uh, the, the pro-choice slogan. Um, and uh, it's one that, you know, obviously you cannot equate um, uh, forcing someone to be uh, a person with a uterus to be pregnant for nine months and bear a child with somebody having to put a bandana over their face when they go to the grocery store. Um, those are uh, very different uh, kinds of um, choices that are, are involved. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, whoever, whoever first came up with that, it's a very clever um, twisting of, of progressive rhetoric. The middle school cheerleading team, I have no idea what they were thinking. I have no idea how, uh, because I was a cheerleader in 1977 or 1978, so it was a little bit past the heyday of the Black Panther Party, but not by that much. And I have no idea how long the Pilgrim Park Panthers were using Black Panther slogans and who started that. Um, once again, you know, there, I mean, there, there is a like, you know, um, it, there, there is a parallel there. There's a, there's a kind of like, you know, we got you. There's a sort of a nastiness behind it um, that uh, is irksome. And that um, um, in the case of um, the cheerleading squad, you know, to me, it really struck me as um, um, like that rhetoric from the Elm Leaves after, after the riots in 1967, it, that it, it carried forward that fear and anger and othering um, in this way that again, like, you know, when I was, when I was chanting that in, in 1978, it never, never occurred to me that that's what I was doing. Thanks. So there's two questions about sort of right wing uh, genealogy or relations between the ultra right go stuff going on in the suburbs and other right wing groups. So the first one is how does the development of ultra right political movement in the Milwaukee suburbs relate to George Rockwell's National Socialist White People's Party and the neo-Nazi movement founded in New Berlin, Wisconsin. So let's start with that one. Well, I don't, uh, I don't have a specific answer about whether there were relationships between the, the John Birch Society and the neo-Nazis, but um, they obviously, uh, they are both projects you know, of uh, reactionary white organizing projects that are um, partly fueled by um, and kind of energized by in response to civil rights organizing. Um, so um, those, the similarities are very clear and um, uh, folks uh, be have noticed from that map, New Berlin is just, just to the south. So this is geographically, this is all this very same, very small region um, where everything is, you know, a 10 to 15 minute drive. Um, I don't know the answer uh, to whether there were um, um, relationships. My guess would be that this is an, an area where class comes into play. Um, and that I suspect um, that those were very different social circles and that there was not a lot of um, intermingling, although um, the content of the ideas uh, was not so vastly different. You know, the John Birch Society is sort of like the more upper crust, respectable version of the, of the Nazi party in a way. That question was from Carrie Bergen, and this is from Ann Bonds. Thank you for sharing information of William Grieve and the John Birch Society. Do you know if there are connections between the Bradley Foundation and the John Birch Society? I don't. Again, um, my research is preliminary and provisional, so I don't. Um. 
And then uh, Chuck asks, as the wow counties, and that's um, Waukesha, Osaki, and Washington, what's the third? Right. Yeah. As the wow counties become less right wing, do you see evidence for the counties further from Milwaukee becoming more right as their population grows? For example, the photo of John Birch float was Evanston, Illinois, which was quite right, but now extremely progressive, while counties further from Chicago are very right. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, um, just as an empirical matter, I don't know the answer to that, whether there's, there are um, shifts in um, the rural counties uh, in Wisconsin. Um, there's, of course, that great book by Katherine Kramer called The Politics of Resentment, Rural Consciousness in Wisconsin and the Rise of Scott Walker um, that uh, looks at um, the, the many um, attitudes um, sh uh, shared by, um, you know, uh, rural residents that she interviewed um, in, in extensive kind of anthropological field work. Um, uh, I just don't know, I just simply don't know as an empirical question whether that has, um, has grown over time or whether we're seeing um, parallels to the shifts we're seeing in the Wow counties where um, there's a, a slow um, move uh, towards the center left. Just to add in, one of the differences between, geographically between uh, Wisconsin and Illinois is that when you move out from Milwaukee, Madison is sitting there. So that kind of changes that. When you move out from Chicago, you don't have a, you know, a parallel kind of progressive city in the way um, if right wing moves in that direction. Uh, Josie Osborne asked, uh, thank you for your presentation. In my experience with Western Waukesha County where I went to high school, there was, was and still is a strong and interconnected but underground progressive movement in the area. The inability of it seems part of its power, or the, sorry, the invisibility of it seems part of its power to protect themselves from bullying of neighbors. Wondering if you could speak to that, it seems parallel to LGBT folks in the 50s. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I think um, gosh, I'm not sure what to, what I how to answer that question. Um, uh, I think there are are moments where um, where we still see, I mean, uh, I'm in an area right now where a lot of the progressive organizing happens very quietly. Um, uh, I'm in an area of upstate New York where a lot of the progressive organizing happens very quietly um, because uh, a lot of places, cases where, as with the parallel with LGBT organizing, where people don't feel safe, um, you know, uh, sharing in like the countywide Facebook book groups what their political views are. Um, and, um, uh, you know, of course, um, uh, uh, another tip of the hat to the Women's March, who's lent uh, their Zoom account. But, you know, the Women's March uh, grew out, the Women's Marches around the country grew out of secret Facebook groups, uh, out of uh, Pantsuit Nation, which is a, a cluster of secret Facebook groups that were secret because people felt that they couldn't be public about their political allegiances. Um, uh, I think that the, you know, the extreme polarization of recent times coupled with the, the um, escalating levels of, of gun violence in the United States um, have, uh, have shaped those, um, those responses. And uh, if anything, uh, you know, m m made that uh, a kind of enduring quality of political organizing around the country. Oops, you're muted. Yeah, just a comment from Kay all, that it was interesting that we hear that abortion should be classed as non-essential medical procedures. And then a question from Ames McGinnis. Um, thank you, it was so interesting to learn more about the Grade family can you say more about where the family's politics came from? How are the roles of women in the family politics similar to or different from the roles of men? Um, 
or the greed family, sorry. Um, and then he cites a book, Conservative Counter-Revolution by Tula Connell, which deals with William Greed in the 50s. Oh, I'll have to check out that book. Um, well, uh, I mean, you know, what I know about where the Grady family politics came from um, is a lot from this uh, commissioned uh, biography um, where, uh, so it's, it's, it's uh, really uh, Bill Grady's own account of how he came uh, to be, uh, you know, a free market uh, champion. Um, uh, he describes his political formation as happening, having happened very early, um, that uh, he had these political instincts um, dating back to the 20s. Um, it's a very close-knit family, and it's very striking that, that, that his daughter, um, Janet Jacobs, um, uh, you know, was a, a, a one of um, these um, women who played a very prominent, like Phyllis Schlafly, who, while um, preaching a gospel of domesticity, uh, was very active in civic affairs um, and in um, pushing uh, a right-wing agenda. Um, this is not atypical of the right. Um, uh, there's a, an, another book here uh, that I've got called Mothers of Conservatism. Uh, I'm sorry, Mothers, yeah, Mothers of Conservatism, Women in the post war Right by Michelle Nickerson. Um, uh, it's a Princeton University press book um, that talks about, uh, and there's an, uh, I mean, it was true in the South, uh, Mothers of Massive Resistance is a book about the, the role of, of uh, white women um, in uh, um, the uh, pro-segregationist movements in the South. Um, uh, Lisa McCurr talks about this a bit in Suburban Warriors. Um, this, uh, we think of this as a paradox, but it's not, it's a feature, not, a, a, it's a feature of these movements that women actually carried um, a lot of the organizing work, um, were um, responsible for a lot of the um, infrastructure building, things like the bookstores and the publications um, that spread these ideas, um, and did so without, um, as Phil Schlafly did, without um, experiencing any there there any conflict there with the rigid gender roles that they were um, preaching at, in in the materials that they shared. And then Lori Loomis uh, asks if the. Greed family, Birch Society, have any had anything to do with the real estate restrictions on home deeds in Waukesha County? You can't, for example, sell your home to anyone who is an other. Yeah, that's a great question, um, and I um, I don't know um, the whole question of restrictive covenants in um, Elm Grove is one that I've heard a lot of rumors about, and I have never been able to pin down any documentation. I, again, had I been able to come back and do more research um, in person, was going to see what I could learn by going and looking at actual deeds in Elm Grove. Um, uh, certainly, uh, uh, Elm Grove was um, almost entirely white and not just white, but Christian when I grew up. Um, the one Jewish family I knew of hid their Jewishness. And the rumor was always that there were restrictive covenants in the deeds and that you couldn't sell um, to, and I don't know how it was worded. Um, uh, so I simply, I don't know. Um, and I don't know um, uh, the extent to which the uh, incorporation of Elm Grove as a separate village was part of that agenda of um, maintaining social and cultural homogeneity, you know, or the extent to which as the other questioner asked whether it was about, um, uh, you know, maintaining a certain tax structure and protecting the wealth. I, I simply don't know. Um, but those are, these are all good questions to ask because uh, clearly those concerns were in the forefront of many people's minds in that period. Thanks. And uh, Lane Hall would like you to talk about the recent open carry protests in Michigan and Wisconsin, ostensibly to open up the states and the visibility of in weaponry and protest. That is the link, I think, between open carry and opening up the states from quarantine. 
I mean, uh, you mean, uh, talk about it besides it, uh, how uh, creepy and unnerving it is. Um, uh, of course, it's meant to be creepy and unnerving. It's meant to be threatening. Um, it's, um, it's meant uh, to be menacing. Um, and, but I also think of it, um, I think of it, uh, you know, I, I, as I noted that the, between the first and the second uh, uh, anti-lockdown open up protests in Brookfield Square, the numbers shrunk. Um, I think of people um, on the left as well as the right turning to armed struggle and bringing weapons or, you know, making that escalation when they don't have support. That that um, kind of escalation to me is one of the um, uh, signs of, uh, of, of extremism and isolation. That if uh, those protesters in fact felt that the majority of people were with them, they wouldn't feel the need to bring the semi-automatic weapons. Obviously, there's a there's a fragile masculinity at play in all of that. With uh, you know, you don't uh, there. I'm sure there were there. Sure, there were some women who were who were carrying weapons, but most of the images that I saw, it was men. Um, and the my body, my choice. I mean, there's a lot that's going on with masking and emasculation and. Um, and so that kind of compensatory move of bringing, you know, the big phallic object with you um, uh, as you um, and your, your small number of supporters um, uh, angrily um, demand uh, change. Um, uh, yeah. Great. So I'll take the prerogative of the um, moderator to ask the last question, I guess. Um, so I want to push you on your glass half full um, take, and in particular on your um, confident claim that, you know, light sanitizes these movements and so forth. And just think a little bit, which I think is, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. But I do want to ask you about the success of Scott Walker and the Republican, Wisconsin Republicans on the right in garnering statewide for Walker, you know, half the state's votes, even whether he lost, even when he lost to Evers. I mean, it was basically 50-50 almost every way. And, you know, clearly he was not, he was very clever in presenting a palatable version of right-wing uh, ideology, and also in sort of concealing some of his plans, because when he came out with Act 10 in uh, the end of 2010, or actually the beginning of 2011, uh, that he had not campaigned on that. And nonetheless, when he came out, out with it, it's not as if he lost his support. He managed to actually uh, retain and perhaps galvanize that support when he did. So you know, I think the story you're telling is about a long history that has stayed fairly marginal, but they're actually, you know, re I've moved in 2010 to Wisconsin and I've lived through uh, the dominance of the right wing. So, yeah, I sent a question as much as just a, I wanted to see how do you put that I mean, in Right. I mean, I think when you, when you look at I mean, it's sort of the difference between Fred Koch and Charles and David Koch in a certain way, right? Is um, uh, Fred Koch, the father, um, you know, helped found the, the John Birch Society and um, embraced this, um, you know, uh, conspiratorial um, extremist uh, vehicle for his agenda. And um, the sons were much savvier. Um, they were richer at that point. They had accumulated many more resources, but they were a lot smarter and they were a lot smarter about, um, as you say, finding more palatable ways to present that agenda, you know, with still keeping some of that, that concealment and subterfuge in order to sneak in things like Act 10. Um, um, much 
you know, instead of having the network of Little John Birch Society bookstores, they had much, had much bigger platforms for communication, um, a much more sophisticated apparatus um, for influencing public opinion. Um, so yeah, it's easy to look at that history and say, um, you know, it's almost like what, what Bill Greedy and uh, the John Birch Society did was like, the first trial run and um, and the, the the subsequent wave, the kind of what I think it was a Tea Party wave, um, uh, figured out you know uh, they weren't as clumsy as the women in the Republican Federation in Waukesha County who were so obvious about like spreading themselves through the room to make it look like they had more support than they had. Um, you know the 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 Tea Party generation through um, through Alec and other means um, came up with much smoother uh, ways to uh, infiltrate the Republican Party with their ideas, um, which were not, you know, in most cases uh, so far away from the mainstream of the Republican Party, not as far away as the John Birch agenda was from the Republican Party of the Eisenhower um, era. Um, uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, were able, the John Birch Society, you know, it was fairly large at a certain point, but it was, it, it was constantly, um, you know, they were constantly like, when you read that, that memoir of the woman who grew up in the family, they were constantly fundraising with you know, licking envelopes in, in the way that you, that I think of grassroots groups on the left doing, they didn't have the, the massive resources that the, the subsequent generation had. Okay. And then, uh, Ames McGinnis can take the last question since uh, Ames is uh, one of our local authorities on Milwaukee. And he says that Dan Hone, Milwaukee's second socialist mayor, was born in Waukesha. And Albert Parsons found brief refuge in Waukesha after Haymarket in 1886. Is there a now hidden history of left politics in Waukesha County? How about the history of anti-slavery and abolitionist politics in Waukesha, is there any legacy there? Well, I don't know the answers to those questions, but those are amazing topics for research, and I would love to know them um, and to know, you know, some of the things that I cited as evidence of a progressive resurgence in recent years in Waukesha County. Um, uh, I I don't know the deep history of that, um, uh, but so thank you for for sharing those tidbits and leads. Um. So I think that's it. I think it's time to thank you, LA, for a wonderful talk. And thank you, audience, uh, for the smooth, everybody for the smoothness of uh, this first C21 virtual event. Um, see you all next Friday. And uh, thanks again, LA. And you're welcome to think in the chat or turn your volume on and clap. So thank you so much, Richard and Maureen. Our pleasure. Thank you. I'm going to end the meeting for everybody now, if that's okay. okay. We will have a recording, by the way, we'll put on YouTube um, in a week or two, so you can access it there or for anyone who missed it and wants to, or wants to relive the magic of this talk. Thank you, LA. Bye-bye. <laughs>